Welcome to the Nanit Community Talk. Hi there, I'm Dr. Sarah Mitchell. I'm a chiropractor by training, but found my passion empowering parents to teach their little ones to sleep and parent confidently day and night as a sleep consultant at Helping Babies Sleep. And I am so excited to be partnering with Nanit to bring expert content to the Nanit community. The community is a place for parents like you to connect with other parents and caregivers on all things parenting. You'll find a variety of content and resources from health and lifestyle experts, giving you tips and tricks to hopefully make your life easier as a parent. The best part, it's free and open to anyone and everyone. Join the conversation today at community.nanit.com. You can see the link in the bottom right-hand corner of this slide. I'm super pumped today to talk to you about baby sleep science. This is one of my passions. It's on the title of my book, The Helping Baby Sleep Method, The Art and Science of Teaching Your Baby to Sleep. So let's dive in. Our agenda today, we're going to talk about just a little background, why we sleep, the systems that govern sleep, what a sleep cycle looks like and how that impacts your life and how sleep cycles differ in the zero to three month stage versus the three month and older stage. So why do we sleep? We sleep because your brain stores new information and memories while you're sleeping. Your brain is washed of toxins during this time. While you're sleeping, nerve cells are reorganizing to support healthy brain function. It's super important for your emotional well-being. I'm sure you've noticed that on nights that you didn't sleep well, you were definitely more irritable or had less patience. And while we sleep, most of our systems are actually slowing down. Our respiration slows down, our circulation slows down, our digestion slows down, but our immune system actually kicks into gear. This is when your tissues are being repaired, your body is fighting off foreign invaders to keep you healthy. So you may notice if you get a lack of sleep or don't sleep as much as you like to, you may catch a cold because your immune system didn't have as much time to fight off those foreign invaders. In our babies, sleep is largely to help avoid overstimulation, which can cause crankiness and you know, just make it harder for your child. The rate of growth is related to sleep pressure rising. What does that mean? Well, let's get into that in the next slide here. We're gonna talk about three systems that govern sleep. So your homeostatic system, which is related to sleep pressure, your circadian rhythm, and your emotional cognitive system. With your homeostatic system, sorry, let me go back here. With your homeostatic system, you're basically what this means. It's related to sleep pressure. So as your body is dealing with respiration, circulation, movement, whatever, you're using fuel for that purpose. When your body breaks down a fuel molecule called ATP, one of the byproducts of that is a protein called adenosine. And that adenosine protein builds up, which is your sleep pressure, and then it hits a point where it signals your brain when, it, when it's time to sleep. What's so cool about this is like babies and adults have this, right? And in adults, you know, exercise helps build your sleep pressure, which is why you sleep better or more tired on nights that you exercise. But caffeine blocks that, which is why caffeine can interrupt your sleep, right? What's really cool about this is it is tied to your rate of growth. So you can imagine from zero to five months, your baby is doubling their birth weight. So they are burning through fuel really quickly, right? They have to eat more frequently. They can't make it as long stretches in the night. And so they are building up that sleep pressure more quickly, which shows up in more naps, right? Your nap need will decrease around five or six months. It goes from three to four hours to two to three hours by six months. And this is directly rate related to the fact that your baby's rate of growth is starting to slow down. Same reason why in that newborn stage, it feels like they really can't stay awake more than 45 minutes to an hour before they need to sleep again, because they are growing exponentially. They need more feedings more frequently. Their stomachs are smaller. They take less food in during that time. And they're breaking down that ATP molecule for fuel, for growth much more quickly. And therefore, they need more naps. Many of you may have heard of the term awake time. The awake time refers to the time from when your child is awake to when they need to be back asleep. It's usually the time that they can comfortably stay awake for. Okay? And in the newborn stage, that might be you know, 45 minutes to an hour. By three months, that might be an hour and a half. By five months, that's two hours. Six months, it's two and a half. And those awake times are based on observation and are directly influenced by this homeostatic system. Right. And so, you know, um, 
kids who are doing more exercise are building up that sleep pressure a little bit more quickly and may need to nap a little bit earlier, right? Which is why when you take your toddler swimming, they're so tired afterwards. They might not make it to their regular nap time. That is why. That's your homeostatic system, your sleep pressure, which directly influences those awake times. Okay. Next, we have the circadian rhythm. So the circadian rhythm, most of us are you know, aware of this. This is the idea about how the hormones of melatonin, cortisol, and the sun influences our ability to sleep and stay awake. So when you wake up for the day, your eyeball is exposed to sunlight that directly tells your brain that it's time to be awake. And when the sun goes down, the sun inhibits the release of melatonin. So when the sun goes down, melatonin then is released in your brain and it signals your body that it's time to sleep. Here's the thing, in our newborn stage, your circadian rhythm is not well developed. The evidence, the research by Dr. Jody Mandel and others shows that your circadian rhythm doesn't fully mature until six months of age, which is why I've definitely observed that naps from child to child will vary between four and five months. By six months, most kids are starting to have very similar napping patterns, but they can definitely vary in that newborn stage, especially, and four and five months, okay? Circadian rhythm, again, is related to your melatonin and your cortisol. So your melatonin is not produced by your newborn. In the womb, your newborn is receiving melatonin via the mother. But then when they're born, they don't produce it on their own yet. They get melatonin from their mother's breast milk. So there's a quick tip if you're pumping and stashing, you might want to write down the time of day that you pump that milk and then deliver it at that similar time of day. Our little ones will start to produce their own melatonin. The research says between nine and 12 weeks of age, which I find absolutely fascinating, right? So what does melatonin do? It signals your brain that it's time to sleep, okay, at night. And what's fascinating is the witching hour, which many of you may have heard of. It's that period between like 6 and 9 p.m. in that newborn stage where our kids are kind of fussy. They want to cluster feed. It's just not really an enjoyable time for most people. You have competing needs of hunger and wanting to sleep. Well, that witching hour starts to recede generally around 10 to 12 weeks, which is interesting because that's when your little one starts to produce their melatonin independently, right? And that signals their brain that it's time to sleep. Of note, there is research out there to show that light entrainment as early as one month of age can help entrain our circadian rhythm. What does that mean? That means as early as one month of age, you want to be making it dark for nap time and light for awake time. And that can help that circadian rhythm develop more naturally. I've, I heard, I hear from so many people that are worried about night and day confusion. Well, you can understand now that where your child's getting melatonin from, you can understand what age it starts to develop. And you can understand that actually making it dark for naps will help them have good naps, which helps your nighttime sleep. It's actually very difficult to have night and day reversal. Okay, because think about this for a second. If your child is awake in the night, it is very rare, your newborn especially, we're talking here, it is very rare that your newborn is content and awake in the night. If they are awake in the night, it's because they're fussy. They're usually crying. And here's the thing, something is bothering them. They're either overtired, they need to burp, they're hungry, they have gas, there's another, there's a root need under there that's not being addressed. Versus when your child is awake during the day, usually they're relatively content, right? So is it actually true night day reversal or is it actually that there's a root issue going on that you haven't quite addressed yet, okay? Um, there's definitely things that, that can you know, irritate them in the night. I remember one time with my daughter, I had a Diet Coke. She was eight weeks old. I had di a Diet Coke at like 7 p.m. and she was inconsolable between two and 3 a.m. That was not night day reversal. That was the fact that she was really uncomfortable. <clears throat> Similarly, I work with a lot of parents who are like, am I letting them sleep too much in the day? Is that impacting our nighttime sleep? Well, tell me about your nighttime sleep. Well, she's up, she's fussy. I, I nurse her, I get her down, she wakes up again. There's something going on there, right? There's a, a root issue that's not being addressed, um, even though a parent might be trying. And so they're usually compensating for that loss of sleep and sleeping more during the day. I often get um, asked questions. Do I ever wake kids up during the day? Can you let a newborn sleep too much? A newborn needs 16 to 20 hours of total 24 hour sleep. That's a lot. That is a lot, but you'll also notice that it's a huge range, right? There is definitely variability in that. And so I personally feel it's very difficult for a newborn to sleep 
too much during the day. I feel like sleep begets sleep. And the more well-rested your kiddo is, the easier it is to get them to fall asleep and then stay asleep. So I only wake kiddos up if I feel like it's been too long since their last feed. So for a newborn, if it's been you know three and a half, maybe four hours since their last feed, I will wake them up to feed. Similarly, kids over four months of age, do I ever let them sleep too more in the daytime? Again, I use that feeding rule. And then yes, I might cut, uh, cut the nap early in the evening if I feel like it's going to impede on my nighttime sleep. You can check out our other webinars we have on newborn sleep and on um, baby sleep basics for four to 24 months. Okay. In general, though, key takeaway from this slide is that the circadian rhythm, it doesn't fully mature until six months of age. Sleep does tend to kind of have a leap and get better around six months of age for many people. There is variation in naps. A newborn might be napping anywhere in you know three to four hour chunks in the daytime. Um, and melatonin and cortisol are the key hormones released by our body that are important for regulating our circadian rhythm. The third system involved in sleep is the cognitive emotional system. And this is true for babies, newborns, adults, okay, everybody. And it's this, any distraction can impact sleep because what do you need to have great sleep? You need to be able to turn off your brain, relax down into sleep. And anytime you hear sleep regression, I want you to think growth and distraction at any age. So my child is growing physically or neurologically and that's distracting him or her from falling to sleep. And the main one we you know, often learn about is that four month sleep regression. It is legit. It is related to object permanence. So your child starts learning that you exist even though they can't see you and they start calling for you more. So I often have parents who are like, in shock because they were having great sleep at three months. Maybe they were getting six to eight hour stretches and then their child hit the three and a half month because the four month sleep regression can start as early as three and a half months. They hit that point and now their kiddo starts waking up every three hours in the night and they're just gobsmacked that this is happening because they thought they had it made, right? And this is the four month sleep regression object permanence. They realize you exist, call for you, see if you come. Okay. But growth and distraction can happen at any age, especially with teething. So what happens with teething is your child surfaces from a sleep cycle, which all humans do. We're going to jump back a couple of slides and take a look at that sleep cycle in just a sec. And they, um, they are distracted then by the discomfort in their teeth and it prevents them from relaxing back down. That's how teething impacts things. And the thing with teething is it's the pain is recedes once that tooth pierces through the gum. So it's kind of hard. It's kind of like a hindsight diagnosis. Finally, the tooth comes through, you can see it and you're like, oh my God, that's what that was, right? And teething does, does ebb and flow. But because of this with sleep regressions, you can imagine that, you know, if my child got five months teeth at five months, I might call that a five month sleep regression. But if your child got their first tooth at eight months, you might call that the eight month sleep regression. So don't hold too much weight to the, the ages associated with sleep regressions. Four months, yes, that's very neurologically driven and that's related, but the other ones, they can ebb and flow. There tends to be one around nine months, which is related to the end of object permanence. And that's what often people refer to as separate, separation anxiety. They often have one preferred caregiver and that is very legit. And then the other ones kind of ebb and flow. There's definitely a lot of different sleep regressions. Just like adults, you have acute bouts of insomnia every now and again, because you're thinking about something, you're worried, you're stressed, you're excited. It's the same with our kiddos. And this can happen as early Early as you know, the distraction part. I remember being in an apartment one time with a one month old or uh, six week old in the snoo, and she just wasn't going down. But we know we got our awake times right, the timing was right. So, what was going on? Well, the room was completely bright, and that little kiddo was just staring on a, at a shadow on the wall, and she was distracted by that. So, we moved that snoo into a dark room, we limited distractions, and she was able to fall asleep. So, don't discount distractions and environment, even in these newborn early stages. Okay. All right. I'm going to think my slides are a little out of order here. So we're just going to hop back here. I thought this would be useful for you to give a visual to see about how the homeostatic system and the circadian system work together. Okay. So over here we have, um, let me make sure I have a little pointer for you. Okay. We have 7 a.m. So you wake up and all day long, your little kiddo, and this is really for adults, but you can imagine, imagine 11 o'clock is nap time, let's say, okay. Instead of 11 p.m. Um, your sleep drive is increasing right? And then you fall asleep and it drops, which is why it's so hard to get our kiddos back to sleep at 5am because that sleep drive is so much lower that time of day. Okay. 
And then this green line here is your circadian rhythm. So naturally, you know, when it's maturing around six months, you're having this sleep gate. It says 11 o'clock here. Obviously, it will be earlier for a child. It's usually around 7.30 p.m. sleep gate for six months and older. And then, you know, your circadian rhythm is driving to keep you awake during the day and then dropping closer to the end of the day as well. Okay. All right. Oh, I love showing you sleep cycles. This is really cool. Okay, so this sleep cycle is for kiddos three months and older and it applies to adults and it's a generalization, okay? So what happens here? You can see you're awake in this yellow line up here and then you drop into stage one sleep, stage two sleep, stage three three sleep. For our purposes, we're going to call those light sleep. This is when you're lying on your bed, you're trying to doze off. Maybe you notice some sounds in the background, but you're dozing awake. Maybe you hear a loud sound that kind of jogs you awake. And you're like, oh, I was just dozing. That's your light sleep. Okay. Down here, we have deep sleep. These are slow wave sleeps. This is the this is the meat and potatoes of sleep. This is the good stuff that all of our bodies need to function properly. Because in this deep sleep stages, your body is releasing growth hormone, especially our growing bodies. Growth hormone is responsible for growing muscles and bones and growing in general. Also in deep sleep, that's when our brains are being washed of all those toxins and we're making repairs and your memories are being formed and learning is being cemented. Very important stuff. And you will notice deep sleep, not a lot of it over the whole course of the night, really a small percentage of our sleep overall. Light sleep tends to make up the majority of our sleep. From deep sleep, then you will pass back into light sleep, go up into REM sleep. And in three month olds and adults, REM sleep is your voluntary muscles are actually paralyzed in this stage. The only voluntary muscles that are active are your eyeballs that are going back and forth and your diaphragm, which is breathing, responsible for breathing. Otherwise your body is not moving, okay? And REM sleep is also known as dream sleep. That's when you're dreaming, okay? And then it's not on this diagram, but sometimes you have a little spike at that REM sleep. And that's where you would have an arousal because all humans wake up in the night. This is what I found fascinating when I was going through this. I didn't really realize that all it's natural. All humans do wake up in the night, but not all humans need to be rocked or fed or have a pacifier reinserted to continue night sleeping or to maintain it, okay? But all humans do wake up in the night, yes. And then you go back down into light sleep, deep sleep, you come back up again and it cycles couple key things to notice from this diagram, right, is when you come out of sleep, you're actually coming out of REM sleep, which is why most of us remember our dreams as adults, okay? The other thing to notice is from these peaks, if you're looking from REM to REM, you'll notice that the cycles are getting shorter, okay? How long is a sleep cycle? How long is awake to REM, let's say? The research shows for infants, let me rephrase that, the research shows for babies, let's say, three months and older, it's five, zero, 50 minutes, but that most kids will go through one or two sleep cycles, um, sorry, two or three sleep cycles before they surface from sleep. So that's usually two and a half to three hours at night. And anecdotally, this is what I very commonly see. My kiddo wakes up every two and a half, three hours in the night and I have to go insert sleep crutch here, insert pacifier, insert a bottle, breast. I have to rock them back down every two and three and a half hours. So what's happening is your kiddo falls asleep with, with something external. And we cover this more in baby sleep basics for four to 24 month olds. But basically your kiddo falls asleep a certain way. They have a certain sleep association. Maybe it's being held, fed, what have you. They go through a couple sleep cycles and then they surface from sleep and then they they have an arousal and then they look for that same thing to help them fall back into the next sleep cycle. Okay. And what's also important on this diagram is how the sleep cycle lengths start to change overnight. So if you look from yellow to yellow, REM sleep to REM sleep, you'll notice that the sleep cycles are getting faster and that you have no deep sleep the latter half of the night. So I frequently hear from parents who say my five month old, my four month old, my six month old, whatever, wakes up every hour after 1 a.m right? Because they never get into deep sleep. They also have faster sleep cycles. It's, you remember from the other side, your sleep drive is lowering. So it's harder to fall asleep. And that waking up every hour, say after midnight or 1am is a classic sign, four months and older of being overtired. Newborns, I often notice parents report that as well. And that's often related to one being overtired, but also having gas as well. Okay. All right. So key takeaway from this diagram, 
right? Sleep cycles, five, zero minutes, also kind of identified as the 45 minute nap, right? Because that happens during the day. They surface from one sleep cycle and look for help falling back asleep. Sleep cycles, generally you get two to three, the beginning stretch of sleep. That's when you have the deep sleep, which is important for your growth hormone being released, your brain being washed of toxins, those memory formations. Sleep cycles get faster as the night goes on and you don't have any deep sleep the last half of the night and your sleep drive is definitely lower. So those later four or five a.m. wake-ups are harder to get your kiddos back to sleep for. Okay. Now in contrast, apologies for the blurriness. It was hard to get a good copy of this, but what's important is the formation. So you just saw a sleep cycle on the last slide for you know three months and older, and you saw that kind of you know U-shaped dips. Okay, this is a newborn sleep cycle, less than three months. Can you see the difference here? These are more square light, and here's what's different. Okay, in the newborn sleep, we don't have that light sleep phase. They basically are awake, boom, they're asleep, they're in deep sleep, they come up and they're in REM sleep. And this is when we often have sleeping like a baby, right? Because it's like, bam, they're asleep, bam, they're awake, but they're in a lot of deep sleep in comparison to those later stages after three months. There's much less deep sleep there, okay? The other key difference here is what's happening in REM sleep. Remember REM sleep we talked about, we called it dream sleep. So in the newborn stage, it's different. In, the, in three months plus, there's no arm or leg movement. Newborn stage, there is. There are vocalizations, there are muscle twitches. This is when you're seeing your baby smile in their sleep and you think it's gas. Nope. They're just in REM sleep or they move a limb or they squeal or they make noises. So one quick tip is when you hear your baby make noises in their sleep, don't pounce and pick them up right away. Come to them and observe. Are they really awake? They might be in REM sleep. I am sure that I was too keen to meet my baby's needs and I pounced. I just kept pouncing. And I think looking back now, I probably picked him up a few times when he wasn't even really awake. Okay. So it's normal to make noises in your sleep. It's normal to smile um, and make vocalizations. Okay. So why is this relevant? Well, here's the thing. So um, in Baby Sleep Basics, we talk about how sleep is actually a learned habit. And, you know, when is that happening? Well, it's actually happening pretty early, between four and eight weeks of age. And if you're past that stage, don't worry, there's always more time to work on sleep habits. But it's imprinted, essentially, how we fall asleep in that four to eight week period, okay? And if your kiddo falls asleep in arms and then you're able to transfer them down into the bassinet, that's awesome. What you're watching for or why the transfer can then sometimes stop being as easy well now you know that their sleep cycle is changing so before when they were in that newborn stage you were able to put them down they were in deep sleep or REM sleep but now they have light sleep after three months and you might be putting them down in light sleep and what happens is their caveman brain goes danger danger change of position lack of warmth i don't want to be put down and they start waking up on put down Okay, so that's one of the simple things that we teach in the helping baby sleep method is how do you help your little one fall asleep in the bassinet rather than in arms so you can avoid the transfer, which is, you know, one of the benefits of the SNU product out there as well. So newborn sleep looks a lot different. There's no light sleep and it starts to change somewhere around three months of age. Okay, there's no light sleep in that stage. So summary. So how sleep science influences your great sleep? Okay, so remember your, your timing of sleep is important. That's your sleep pressure, your circadian, your sleep drive, your homeostatic system. And it's also influenced by your circadian rhythm, which is fully developed around six months, but you can help and train with light and dark exposure. Dark when you're sleeping, light when your little one's awake. Okay. Transferring to the crib can become more difficult around three months when the sleep cycle changes and your child's now having more light sleep stages rather than just being in REM and deep sleep. In general, newborn sleep is weekly regulated and it's shown that newborns tend to sleep in three to four hour, four hour chunks around the clock essentially, but this does mature significantly by six months. Even around nine to 12 when little newborns are starting pr to produce their own melatonin, that's when that witching period can start to recede and your bedtime starts to get earlier and easier. And light entrainment as early as one month of age can absolutely be helpful. 
if you're looking for more assistance in learning about sleep science and balancing the biology and behavior of sleep, you might want to check out the Helping Baby Sleep Method, which is the art and science of teaching your baby to sleep. This is for babies four weeks to 24 months. We talk about gentle newborn sleep teaching. And if you're past that stage, that's okay because we talk about sleep teaching after four months. And you might want to check out the Baby Sleep Basics video that, we, that I made for, in the Nanit community um, to learn more about that. But it also does help you tackle your naps, your nights, and general sleep science overview and tactics to help you, you know, feel like you're doing everything that you can to help your baby sleep in a gentle way. You can also follow me on uh, Instagram at Helping Baby Sleep. And don't forget to check out more wonderful videos and lessons from our parenting and lifestyle experts inside the Nanit community. That's community.nanit.com. Thanks so much for being here, everyone.